This is the Comparative Effectiveness Research Panel, Rationing Care or Improving Quality. And I'd like to just open up with a, a comment or two before we start up with our speakers today. I'd like to start up with just a quick comment. Comparative effectiveness research has sometimes been hailed as the next best thing in healthcare. Some say that studying clinical effectiveness of different healthcare treatments will lower costs, improve patient care, and improve healthcare overall. Others, doctors, uh, research and analysts, patients as well, have said comparative effectiveness research may lead to rationing of health care and drugs when, gov when the government picks the winners and losers. And that's, it, that phrase right there has given this issue a whole lot of attention with Obamacare and the uh, picking of winners and losers. And we'll have more to talk about that on the rest of the afternoon here or the next hour and a half or so. Um, we are excited and thrilled today to have a panel of uh, three panelists of nationally renowned experts to discuss the pros and cons of comparative effectiveness research. I'd like to begin first with a housekeeping point. If you end up leaving before the session is over, or if you uh, just need to get up, uh, please, if you want to receive a copy of the PowerPoint presentations, then leave your name and email address on the, the forms in the back. If you'd like to, we'd like you to sign in as well to record that you were here. Um, and then after the panelists each have an opportunity to speak, we will have a, a question and answer period for the rest of the uh, rest of the time. We're going to begin here today with Twyla Brays, who's president and co-founder of the Citizens Council for Health Reform. It's a freedom-focused, patient-centered health care, national health care organization, which is based in St. Paul, Minnesota. Twyla provides a daily radio commentary, and testimony at the legis at the legislature. As well, she meets regularly with members of Congress and speaks around the country. In August 2009, she was featured in Modern Healthcare magazine as one of the top, excuse me, as number 75 on the top 100 most powerful people in healthcare across this country, which is a great um, recognition and congratulations very much there. And in 2000, uh, Minnesota Physician Magazine selected Twyla as one of Minnesota's most influential healthcare. Uh, leaders as well. She holds a uh, bachelor's degree in nursing from Gustavus Adolphus College in St. Peter, Minnesota, which I was there last year, not at the college, but in St. Peter on a nice uh, sunny, warm day as opposed to a cold day. And I uh, really enjoyed it. And also was at the National Convention there a few years ago. Really enjoyed St. Peter from personal perspective. She, um, she specialized in emergency room nursing in college and, and as uh, also a certified public health care nurse. With that, um, we're honored to have Twyla Brays here today, and I'm going to ask her to come forward and make her presentation, and then I'll make the introductions um, thereafter of Michael Tanner and also um, Robert Goldberg. Thank you very much for being here this afternoon. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and really happy that Christy decided to invite me because this has been an issue near and dear to my heart for a very long time. As a matter of fact, in 2005, um, we did a report um, called, wouldn't you know, I love it, and I can't remember my own report, but um, uh, how technocrats are taking over the practice of medicine. And then Alec asked us to do sort of a, a revision of that in 2008, and that report is sitting in the back there about evidence-based medicine. And comparative effectiveness Research and evidence-based medicine go together, as you'll see here in my speech. Um, I think at stake in the debate over comparative effectiveness is not only patient care, but the integrity and foundation of our freedom in this country. Gail Walensky, the former director of HICFA, which is now called CMS, wrote the following in Health Affairs four years ago. To date, all the countries with a centralized process for performing comparative clinical and economic assessments are countries with centralized payer systems like Canada, England, Australia, and Germany. So are Americans ready to give control of their personal medical decisions over to centralized authorities? She writes also that CER, uh, comparative effectiveness research, CER research won't work without penalties, saying better information about comparative effectiveness of various medical strategies and procedures might not in itself lead to better decision making in healthcare unless there is also a major change in financial incentives. 
This essentially means command and control over the practice of medicine. The drive to comparative effectiveness research began with Medicare, a centralized payer system in this country. Ms. Wolensky notes, since the enactment of the Medicare program in 1965, a great deal of legislation has been passed with the purpose of curbing the escalation in Medicare's costs and controlling the diffusion of medical technology. Importantly, she also says, such efforts have been largely ineffective. Comparative effectiveness research began in the U.S. in 1975 with the Office of Technology Assessment. Since then, we've also had the Consensus Development Program at the NIH, the National Center for Healthcare Technology, and the Agency for Healthcare Policy and Research, which was renamed the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, ARC, in 1999. Today, ARC has a staff of about 300 people and an annual budget of over $300 million. It also has a national clearinghouse for treatment protocols, um, a dozen evidence-based practice centers around the country, and a $15 million per year budget for its effective healthcare program. In addition, the VA does comparative effectiveness research, and CMS is a client of the Technology Evaluation Center established by the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association in 1985. So, in other words, when it comes to the new comparative effectiveness research mandate, I'd like to say there's nothing new under the sun, at least since the mid-70s. However, there is a new bureaucracy, new money, and a new law. So what's the purpose of comparative effectiveness research? Very, very clearly, it is intended to build a case against the use of new technologies, treatments, and medications. As Ms. Molensky wrote in her support of such research, it's about limiting access to care. There are many terms, euphemisms, and code words meant to garner support for comparative effectiveness research. Let's explore just two. Number one, quality. It is said that CER will improve quality of care. So exactly what is quality? Think about it. Would any of you agree on the definition of quality? One writer says quality is, of course, an elusive concept which makes its assessment all the more difficult Yet the Minnesota Community Measurement Project funded by our state health department says a quality doctor is a doctor whose patients have good cholesterol levels and don't smoke. Now, what does the doctor have to do with cholesterol levels and smoking? Isn't that the patient? Another study claimed that giving flu shots is quality care. But what if the patient refused the vaccination? Is that a bad doctor or a smart patient? Or what if the doctor gave the vaccination but fails to give attention to the patient's real reason for coming in? The National Report on Health Quality says patient-centeredness is declining. Patients no longer feel respected or listened to. Could that be because doctors are focused on quality checklists, not patient concerns? So does quality mean the same to you or me? Probably not if we got together we would disagree on what quality is. That's because you and I vary in personality, physiology, genetics, preferences, finances, philosophies, cultures, reactions to medications, lifestyles, beliefs, schedules, and we could go on and on with the list. The proponents of measuring quality mean to standardize care through comparative effectiveness research. Why would standardization be called quality of care when you and I differ as much as night and day? Here's an example of research on quality. Stephen Lieberman et al. say that Medicare spending in high cost regions provides no important benefits in terms of survival. Is that the only indication of quality? The survival rate. I looked beyond the headlines of the study to its limitations. There the authors revealed that they only examined the functional status of the general population, not the three high risk chronic disease groups they were studying. Then they add this comment. Although the quality of care provided to the three chronic disease 